I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okame. We are the Super Media Bros Podcast, and we are founding members of the Odd Pods Media Network. Hi, I'm Tina Hadamio. And I'm Hillary Doherty. And we host the Muck Podcast, where we discuss the dark and sometimes weird true stories in American politics. Hey, Tina, did you know that Elvis crashed the Nixon White House for the sole purpose of getting a DEA badge and it worked? What? <laughs> or how a gun control advocate senator out of California engaged in gun trafficking with notorious gang leader Shrimp Boy? <laughs> Shrimp Boy, I remember him. Okay, so you know we cover all of that and more from Malady madness mischief and murder in u.s politics and we also host a bi-weekly interview segment called lil muck we interview politicians journalists activists and others who share their experiences in politics find the muck podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and check us out on social media at the muck podcast bad guy he laughed a lot you're not sorry you're pathetic getting even all this and more are you ready to do some karate kicks Fuck yeah. Super Media Bros. just knock i don't know <laughs> that one time we were trying to record but uh leroy was cutting the fucking grass the fucking outside. lawnmower simulator <laughs> we talked to him the day before he knew he fucking knew we were recording <laughs> you could see us through the fucking window and he was just like i'm about to ruin this whole man's career let them sweat Welcome to episode 190 of the Super Media Bros Podcast. I'm in that agent raw, and today I am joined once more by special delivery dev. What's up, dude? What's going on, man? I invited this motherfucker over for Cult <laughs> Cinema Showdown 82. Champagne and Bullets, a.k.a. Get Even, a.k.a. Roads of Revenge versus Joel D. Winecoop's <laughs> Lost Faith, and God damn. I want to know how one of these was made and why one of these exists. There's no correct way to get into this. I want to specifically know why one of them exists and the other one shouldn't have been as good as it was. I don't get it, but we're going to find out together. I was at a loss at first because initially after the first one ended, I was like, all right, we got a winner here. All right. And then the second one happened and there is a scene. I don't want to spoil it just yet, at least. But there is a scene in this. In which there's a car chase that leads into a, I don't even know how you would, just a, just a freeway fight, essentially. Like, it was a park freeway, whatever. Let's, let's pull over and settle our differences like men. Yeah. Whenever that scene hit, I was like, please, for the love of God, let this have no further context. Please let this just be a random scene that is never explained, and it'll be perfect. So, until we get to that. Let's go ahead and jump into Champagne and Bullets, a.k.a. Get Even, a.k.a. Road to Revenge. Now, before we really dive into it, I, I want to stress a couple of things here. Vinegar Syndrome is responsible for some of the greatest cult films that have ever existed being put back into the hands of the viewer or put into the hands of the viewer for the first time. Great artwork, great restoration. They are responsible for Champagne and Bullets even existing because John D. Hart, lawyer, I stress <laughs> lawyer, is the filmmaker, writer, editor, director, producer, star. He, he wishes he was Tommy Wiseau, but boy, I, I think this is if, if Tommy Wiseau made an action film or quote an action film, th this would be it. And I will point out because I know there are a few of you out there that know the get even version, because that was the one that was most widely distributed back in the day. Champagne and bullets, however, takes the original negatives and restores them to the original vision that John D Hart had. So road to revenge was kind of like a neutered cut. It was like 75 minutes. Then the get even cut is like 89 minutes. This one's an hour and 30 and you feel every minute of it. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to give the plot synopsis and I'm going to just let you 
just yeah because i know i know you have some shit to say about this one just as much as me the synopsis is that two cops are fired after being set up by their corrupt boss who gets appointed as judge but secretly heads a satanic cult after his wife is killed by the cult one of the cops is determined to bring the cult down oh my god it doesn't even go that quickly and it's not even that simple okay so here's the thing you just read that plot right Right. In my mind, I mean this mildly ironically, mildly unironically. This has got to be the greatest film ever. You know, just based off of the synopsis, that's, is that not something that I would just pray to the heavens to be made? Right. Like, just like the, the synopsis I sent you earlier for a movie where I was like, motherfuckers get slaughtered by a samurai's spirit on Christmas Eve. Right. Like, that, it just sounds great. So I'm in. And, and um, you would expect there to be fast pacing. There would be a whole lot of pretty corny, but still like really gratuitous, just blood and gore, you know, just garbage movies that you would like. You know, they're not good, but you enjoy watching them every single time. Right, dude. And, and the other part about this that is really funny is based on what you just said. The title of like the retitling of the original vision of this and the fucking artwork that Vinegar Syndrome put together for this. Jesus Christ, it's yeah. beautiful. Dude, whenever you sent it to me, I was like, bruh, this is either going to be the greatest thing I've ever seen or it's going to be mishandled. It was both. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. That all said, the synopsis sounds very simple. It's not. In fact, there are points within this film where I'm like, what is the plot? I really don't know. Yeah, because it literally opens on Rick, who is the main character played by John D. Hart, and then it stars Wingshauser. Okay, I want to know William Smith, Wingshauser, and Playboy Playmate Pamela Jean Bryant. How did this man get these people to be a part of this fucking movie? I will never know, but what I will say is that John D. Hart absolutely made this so he could pretend or possibly actually pork a Playboy model on camera so he could be like, see, grandkids, this is what I did back in 1992. Your old man was a somebody. Look at that broad. Because <laughs> you know he says broad. Oh, dude. And if anybody is looking at like the picture of Road to Revenge, he looks like a fucking deer in headlights with his bro tank top on and his <laughs> shitty fucking machine gun. So I want to point out some shit about these characters. Rick, Huck, and Normad are going to bust these dudes in a fucking drug raid. And Rick is just like, well, we really need a warrant. And Normad's like, oh, we'll just plant some fucking cocaine on him or some shit. <laughs> and Normad is played by William Smith, who sounds like Sergeant Slaughter with throat cancer. He really does. It's he bad. looks like him, too. It's pretty bad. Like the, the mustache, like the thin little pencil stash. Yeah. As soon as I saw him, I was like, ugh, I feel uncomfortable already. Right. But, and, and this is how the plot gets further along. So, in the middle of this raid, then Huck is shot. And then Rick is admonishing Normad, who is his superior, by the way, for almost getting him killed. So, he's like, he fucking knees him in the dick. <laughs> and then he's on the ground. He's just like, you just made a big mistake. And then Rick, not a problem. See? And, what response is that? And, and the, that's the thing. As soon as that all happened, I was like, this is the movie we're getting. Okay. Right. Now, in the get even cut immediately after this, it cuts to Rick practicing martial arts on this fucking punching bag. And it is the most stupid shit ever because he's just like, huh, huh, huh. And he's just punching and punching. And you're just like, oh, what the hell is even happening? Now, was it this one or was it the next film that I kept saying, look at how he's punching it? From the top. Was it this one or was it? I think it was the second one, which okay. goes to tell you, everybody, like this is what you're in for. Where, number one, they're both of the same quality, the same questionable quality. And the whole time you're just like, what the fuck? And mind you, we did our homework, ladies and gentlemen. We didn't just watch Champagne and Bullets. We watched all three versions of this. We did this for you. So by all means, subscribe, click like. Whatever you got to do, please put food on our tables. We deserve it after this. Leave a fucking review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. We usually plug that at the end, but we're suffering and we're not yeah. even fucking through the first half of this bitch. Not even the first quarter. <laughs> we, we literally went through the opening sequence. Yeah. Dude, 
I forgot to point this out about the whole punching bag thing. The fact that John D. Hart had the wherewithal to have this sequence cut out of the road to revenge and champagne and bullet cut. Yeah, that was weird. Like as it's almost like the samurai cop movie where within the first one, we never got the sense that he was an actual samurai. Right. They, they just mentioned it. And then within champagne and bullets and get even and everything, I was like, okay, so who is this guy? Right. After the fucking dick kick city thing happens, <laughs> Normad frames Huck and Rick for being in the drug ring, but they failed to mention that this takes place a year later in the courts as, as it does in the get even cut in the champagne and bullets cut. It just goes right to it. And I did not even, I even said this as we were watching the other two cuts. I was like, I did not get the sense that this was a whole year later. It was like one day later. Yeah, like, I I don't know. It it was just spliced there. And that happens a lot in this movie where scenes just abruptly end and the (laughs) next one, dare I say, comedically begins. Oh, yeah. And you you made me laugh because uh, fucking William Smith had to have been drunk for this scene. Let's talk about how they do this. Like when you yeah. said they abruptly cut, he fubs a fucking line on the take and they leave it in. Yes. Not only that, this man. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I almost had to walk out during this part because I couldn't even listen to him. Was it like secondhand cringe embarrassment? You know what I'm talking about? Like when, when you see somebody just like trying real hard, but they're kind of fucking up and you're like, oh, oh God, like even, it hurts you. It, I did experience that. But more than anything, I was trying not to laugh because I could not hear a single word he was saying because I kept staring at his outfit. This man looked like a fucking Grand Theft Auto loading screen. <laughs> the, dude, okay. It's, all right, people, when you're listening to this, I don't know how far into the future you're listening to this because this is going to be put on the internet. It'll be out there forever. But right now it is 2021. Go back. If you were in 2030, go back and look up Don Callis 2021. This is the type of shit he's wearing right now. He looks like fucking Don Callis with the fucking sunglasses and everything. This is like Vice City loading screen, bro. It's bad, man. I was just staring at it. I was like, what is the tone for the? What is the color coding? The, the color grading? What is, what is this? I don't know, but Huck gets pissed off as the hearing continues and he punches the police officers that are coming to take him like into content or whatever. Like when he was like, Oh, I'm holding you in contempt of court. Come get him. And he just punches people. He's like, dude, you're already like in deep shit and nobody's going to believe you. So you just do what you punch fucking the police officers. And then the literal next scene, this is the abruption we're talking about the literal next scene. They are both somehow free drinking Miller fucking light and these God awful outfits. First off, Huck looks more put together. Rick is in this entire fucking USA tracksuit looking shit. And it doesn't even look like that nylon. It looks like... Like a windbreaker, maybe? Yeah, but it looks like it's fleece material. And I'm just like, dude, that's got to be fucking so hot. Yeah. And that's the thing. I forgot that this scene even existed, but they were on like a shooting range. And I'm watching this and I'm, again, I'm wondering, when does this take place? Right. Nobody knows. No, nobody does. And then the next shot, is Rick is randomly driving these kids to prom and they're drinking in his, in the back of his car. And I didn't even realize that's what he was doing. Yeah. And, until you pointed it out. Yeah. What it was, was like, he was basically chaperoning. That was like his side gig, I guess. Or I don't know, because initially I thought, oh, is that something that cops have to do every once in a while? Like they get prom duty or whatever. Like, is that a thing? Maybe. I don't know. Whatever. But then you pointed it out. He was like, he's like fired. Like, yeah, he's, he's gone. Like they fired him from the, but what made me laugh is he's got, this guy has so many wardrobe changes throughout this fucking movie and he's got his leather pants on and his leather gloves that he's driving in this like fucking members only looking jacket. That's also black and his fucking hair. And he dumps these kids on the side of the fucking road and just leaves them there because they're like, Oh, I got to piss my old man. He's like, all right. And so he lets them all out of the car and they fucking like, he drives away. Dude. And. Okay, you want to talk about the fucking leather? The next Bruh. scene. The next scene where he shows up. Did you jump at the bar? Yes. Oh, God. Okay, black cowboy hat. A brown leather jacket. Black leather pants. 
and he wears the black leather pants like several times. In this. Yeah. And I, I would understand if they at least looked good, but it's like the the fucking tie up zipper type yeah. of thing. Like it it wasn't right. No, not at all. And 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 this is this sequence here, everybody, is the and we'll get to it in just a second. Because I have a, a couple of things to point out beforehand, but this is the okay. infamous shimmy slide scene. <sighs> Ex- shimmy slide. Exactly. So Rick is talking to Cindy, who is his ex girlfriend, or whatever, or like his estranged wife, or what, whatever the fuck. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't. They never said really. She, he's like, oh, you must have left town for a while, and she's like, yeah, I did. And he's like, well, things have changed. I quit the force. And she's like, you quit, quit, got fired. What's the difference? <laughs> There's a huge difference. Yeah, exactly. So th- this is the chick that dumped him. Either way, but I want to know who is the ghastly chick with the permanent shit smell face. Oh, oh god, the one that looked like the old school Planet of the Apes. Right, dude. She genuinely looked like my ball sack whenever it shrivels in the cold. But then they're just like, "Oh, Rick, sing a song," and he's like, "No, nah, I don't want to." Like, yeah, go sing a song, and he's like, "Oh, okay." And it, it's no rehearsal. <laughs> You swear he doesn't know who these fuckers are on the stage that are in the band without a drummer, mind you. <laughs> and there's a fucking drum beat. Yeah, and I'm assuming it's on the keyboard, but it sounds too real to be ha- to have been done on a keyboard. Yeah. So they just start playing, and, and this song gets played like six or seven more times throughout the film instrumentally, but you just hear that... And, and he's just sitting there, and I gotta give it to him. He went all out for this shit. He did. And you know what? As I was watching it, I, was, I, I even pointed this out. I was like, this could have been the most baller ass shit. Like the whole the- thing? Yeah, yeah, oh, the yeah. whole thing. That scene, that could have been like the dopest thing. But my man just stood there staring blankly. And his little fucking like the way he yeah, was moving left was, and right. Yeah, he was just kind of mildly shuffling. Like he was so stiff. He was shimmy wooden. sliding. Yeah, he was just, <laughs> just just so wooden in the face, stiff in the body, stiff in the dick. Probably, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, look at who he was talking to. Right. So the whole thing, I was like, bro. And this goes for the whole film, but it can be perfectly encapsulated in this one scene where it's like. You're so close. You have an idea here, but you don't know how to fucking do it. You don't have, number one, the charisma. You don't have the sense, the wherewithal. You don't, you just don't know what you're doing. Right. Well, in this sequence, it's like these four dudes come up and harass Cindy and (laughs) a fight breaks out. And there's a lot of differences between this cut and the other two cuts. One is the other cuts of this film Okay, so the Road to Revenge cut cuts a lot of the, actually all of the nudity completely out. Yep. It even leaves a little bit of it in, but Champagne and Bullets just has all of it. Like, they had all this footage, and they were just like, put it in. Yeah. Don't cut. Put this Put this in. I filmed it all. You show it all. Exactly. So, like, there's this chick that's stripping to the shimmy slide instrumental. These two chicks in the bar are just like, ew, and one of them reports the public nudity, which explains why the police actually show up, because you don't get that context. Otherwise, it's just a bar fight happens and cops are magically there. I want to know how old was the girl that reported this? Because she... Oh my god. She looked like she shouldn't have been there. That's what I'm saying. I was like, what? Who is this? I don't know, but... I just remember that Huck punches more fucking cops and he's, he got arrested for that. And bro, I know they're at a bar and I know the beer is expensive. Now he poured a whole ass Corona light on this motherfucker. Exactly. And here's where I'm coming from with this. Whenever he punched the cops at the court, (laughs) you could have cut that scene out because he was already in deep shit. He was already getting fired. That Cutting that out would not have affected his story arc. You could have cut Huck completely out. Oh, absolutely you could have. There's one scene, just one scene where he has a line of dialogue and I was like, hold on, hold And then he says one more thing after the fact. And then I'm like, see, now you ruined it. So you, you can't even redeem his character. But either way, if you have to have, because we got to look at the time period here. There, buddy cop movies were a thing. So I'm sure that that's, the reason why Huck was there, whatever. But if you're going to have him beat up a cop, put it in the bar scene. 
That would have explained it because he was already drunk. Mm -hmm. In the court scene, he just fucking folds him for no reason. So you could have had the same exact flow of events, but without it being redundant. Again, that's what I'm saying. You're so close, but you don't know what you're doing. Well, I guess Rick knows what he's doing because he goes right to the fucking jailhouse and bails old boy out. And the other guys that they kick their asses are all walking past him and they just look at him. Your ass is mine. Not a problem. Yeah. That's his retort for everything. Not a problem. And the fact that the punches he was throwing, they, oh my God, my kid hits harder. They were just slaps that weren't even making contact to the fucking head. Right. Like, like I can understand if you missed, but you were close fisted or if you were slapping, it was both. And yet neither one at the same time. Yeah, that's cringy. It's really bad. So let's, let's talk about how immediately cuts from the jail sequence to Rick and Cindy having dinner, which also cuts to their picnic. Now in the dinner sequence, Rick tells two God awful doctors jokes to the Mater D who just, I guess is he's a regular there. So the Mater D is just like, Oh Rick, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. And he's just like, you got any jokes for me? It's like, yeah, I got a couple of them, but I'm only going to recite the second one. Cause the first one was pretty stupid too. But this one was like, so man goes to the doctor with a duck on his head. Doctor says, can I help you? And the duck says, yeah, get this guy off my ass. And they just die laughing. Like this is the greatest thing. And I'm just sitting there like, I still, now I have, it has been how many days? Since we watched this three, I still don't get it. Well, the do- because it's like all oh, the doctors asking the duck, what can I do for you? And he's like, get this man off my ass. I don't get it. Yeah. Cause he's sitting on the guy. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's why I was like, oh, that's so fucking dumb. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's, it's beyond dad joke. That's like, it's I, bad joke. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I didn't even get, it. I don't, it's an anti joke where I just genuinely don't know what it is. I love how like in this same thing, they get their Polaroid taken. And then she looks at it and she's like, you haven't changed a bit. And he literally said earlier that things have changed. Not only that, but you can tell as they're filming this, this sequence, she wouldn't stop moving. Like, oh, she's definitely fidgeting, dude. She did yeah. not look comfortable for any of this. She didn't. And you can tell that they did not show what the picture looked like because neither one of them were even in position. It probably didn't even develop at that point. No, probably not, but still, I was like, that's the take? That's the cut? We, we don't waste film here. So it cuts to a picnic. Costume change also. Yeah. Again, and I said this while we were watching it, if you're going to have the dialogue, one setting would have been fine. But really, you could have cut out the entire dinner sequence. Yeah, that dinner sequence, like have one, like you said, have one or the other for sure. Yeah. But this is where we get... This is where we get, like, the plot. Yeah, about uh, 38 minutes into an hour and a half film. So, so Cindy explains that she knows the guys from the bar that came up to her because they're members of a cult, and she tells Rick that she fell into this cult and attended meetings. And the last one that she went to, cue whole flashback. Yeah. Because in the Get Even cut and the Road to Revenge cut, these were both severely trimmed down. Oh, yeah. like. Okay, in this cut, in the definitive champagne and bullets cut, what is it, like seven minutes? Got to be at least of, of I love you, Satan, Satan lives, hail Satan, blah, blah, blah. And it's fucking Normad as the leader of this cult, and they're, uh, they're going to kill this baby. And yeah. Cindy fucks it up because she objects, and they chain her to this upside-down cross, and they gag her. Now, here's what they cut out of both of the Get Even and Road to Revenge cuts. Bro, he stabs the fuck out this baby. He and does. when I say he stabs the fuck out this baby, I mean, they're showing him stabbing, not closely, but they're showing him stabbing this fucking yeah, kid. It, it's a wide shot, but it's still like, you don't have any question about what's happening. Not a whole lot left to the imagination. But what's funny is that baby, they show a shot of overhead where the baby's like laying on his back and he's just like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, he's just looking up like, oh God, what are you doing? Oh God. Oh, please put that down. Please put that drive down, sir. <laughs> That baby was nowhere near newborn, by the way. I love how he said that, too. He's just like this newborn infant. The fucker's got a comb over, dude. I (laughs) I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) Damn, son, how how long you been a newborn? (laughs) About two years. (laughs) I know. 
He fucking pulls a stogie out. About two years. <laughs> he fucking puts that shit out. Go ahead and stab me, you fuck. <laughs> Why did this? <laughs> so stupid. Bro. But, but you know what? At this point, I was like, okay, 38 minutes in, give or take. We're finally getting some form of plot. And I see where this is going. And I see why, I don't want to say all of it. God, no, not all of it. But I understand why a good chunk of this was shown. Because it's starting to somewhat tie in. They were trying to leave the, quote, character development in for these characters. Which, I guess it works to an extent. But, my God, after that flashback happens, she's like, I'm sorry. I tried to stop it, but I couldn't, so I left Hollywood. And I'm like, God, that's a fucked up shit in Hollywood. Yeah. This guy should have left Hollywood too. Yeah. Whenever I was watching it, I was like, okay, first of all, pause. You know, if I were him, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. Uh, things have changed and uh, I'm in a different place now. I'm going to see the door. Hollywood like, sucks. I'm moving to Wisconsin. Yeah. Or whatever the fuck Kenny Hoopla said. Yeah. Like, because here's the thing. Immediately after he puts his arm around her and says, we can get through this. We'll work through this. And she's like, I feel better just talking about it. Bitch, you do not feel better talking about Satan worshiping fuckheads, killing a newborn infant right in front of you while you are bound and tied up. I promise you, no amount of therapy is going to fix that, let alone just talking to some fling. But what makes me laugh is the fucking speed it with which she went from that. Like she goes, I feel better just talking about it. How have you been? How's the acting going? <laughs> how was your sex life? That's the fucking vibe yeah. I got. So anyway, how was your sex life? Yeah. And then he goes on and he fucking just he quotes Shakespeare. He it's, does the to be or not to be like Tommy fucking did. Yeah, he does fucking Hamlet for the whole sequence. He does the whole quote. And like, it's bad. It's so bad. And again, cut it out. I would have laughed my ass off if he actually fucked the lineup where he's just like, to be or not to be? Is that a question? Oh, my. You know what? I'd have what? left that in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck it. We're doing it live. <laughs> doing it the same way they filmed uh, Hugh Jackman's Les Miserables. <laughs> you remember that shit? Yes. They were like, they, they straight up said, all right, we're going to sing this all live. We're not going to do any reshoots for the vocals. <sighs> to their uh, credit, with they did that it. in mind, they did all right. Yeah. But it's still like, why the fuck did you make that call? I don't know. But she's like, well, is you still trying to be an actor? I'm like, he can't even be an actor in his own film. No. And then it immediately cuts to the sex, the first of many sex scenes, because again, this man done hired this woman to have on film to fuck. To his credit, he got his money's worth. That god awful acoustic music that plays during this sequence. And then the zoom in the heart heart zoom in on the burning log where I'm just like, man, his his log is lit. That's what I think he was going for, dude. Because, he had to be. Dude, because there's another sex scene later on in the film where I'm it was like uncomfortably gratuitous so he gets to the bar the next day in this god awful like rugby looking polo long sleeve <laughs> shirt and rick is like well me and cindy are getting back together and huck is legitimately drunk during this take like the actor is drunk and he's just tell. like yeah and he's just like talking as shimmy slide plays again in the background and huck is telling all these customers that they have no class because rick speaks hamlet but he's just rambling at this point, and he's just like, we're celebrating that I lost my house, my wife is fucking all my friends, and he accuses Rick of fucking his wife. So Rick is just like, uh, no problem. And he fucking leaves. <laughs> I don't think he really says that there, but it's just not no. a problem, because that's his response. Not a problem. Yeah. So later, Huck is like legitimately shooting his bill statements. This, this fucking scene is great. He's just like, oh, yeah. he's just like, bill, <laughs> electricity, <laughs> water, and then the next shot is of the toilet. And I thought for sure he was about to fucking light up the toilet with his gun. Oh, my God. But no, he just threw in the what's left of his bills and then flushed them down. But right. Still, I mean, it was pretty fucking funny. Like, at first I was like, oh, shit, what's going on here? <laughs> Dude. Oh, my God. So it goes to him on the sofa <laughs> and his Aww. wife. Kicks him out, and he's just like, why all of a sudden do you need the money? And in this scene where he's arguing with her, 
the camera guy is like holding the camera and I'm assuming it's John Go. and he's like standing up and moving around like wildly, mm-hmm. which this actually got cut in a different way on both of the other cuts of the film. Yes. So he accuses her of banging Normad and she's just like, well, I got what I wanted out of it. He's a judge now. And basically she just reveals that she kind of fucked him over for this. And then she is like, well, I'm going to get what's owed to me because he doesn't have a job. So he can't pay the alimony. So she's just like, oh, calls the cops. Oh, he's attacking me. Come to the disastrous, blah, blah, blah. And then she rips her fucking shirt out and she's just like her titties come out. And she's like, you remember these? You didn't know how to treat them either. And I'm just like, oh, my God, this is the only thing I think nudity wise that they actually left in. I I, want to say I know they left this in get even, but I want to say that they kind of butchered this sequence in the road to revenge cut. No, actually, I, I or was that the only one they actually left? Yeah. For, okay. Well, I, I guess this one is like in co- in uh, completion through the uh, completion is it's in full, you know? Yeah. Which is weird of all the nudity scenes. You, I guess because it made sense to leave this one in because it was like a domestic thing and she, it was kind of comedy. It was kind of dark. It was like, like, remember these titties? You didn't treat them well either. I'm gonna go take them to somebody that'll suck them. This is, again, another cop punching scene that uh, Hug is just like all about this shit. So they show up and she's like, I think he tried to kill me. Like she literally says, I think he tried to kill me. Yeah. And again, like I said, now we have three cop punching scenes. This and a good movie could have been the final straw for him. Right. And it could have worked as a dramatic piece of watching this man's psyche make his downfall but instead we've seen it two other times so now we're just like can't fix him i literally wrote in here jesus this guy is a fuck up and look we're jumping around a little bit but i just want to say this there's like gratuitous just just really unnecessary sex scenes in this there's unnecessary sex scenes and there is a lot of unnecessary woman beating, which that is a thing in movies like this from that time period, which I, I understand like that was kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in a wrestling term to get the heel over. Right. That's how you knew like a piece of shit was a piece of shit in a movie. Right. I get it. But remember how I said that the plot synopsis is very simple, but the film is not. No, the film is complicated as fuck. If you only kept in the plot and these sex scenes, the ratio, this probably would have been 35, 40 minutes and about 15 of it would have been sex. This was a porno that just got stretched out to not be a porno. True. They added just enough to make it not. Yeah. So it cuts from that to the court scene. Bro, John DeHart is in a full leather pant, Christmas plaid shirt, corduroy gray sports jacket, and Jim Cornette glasses. This is his getup. Yeah. And he cusses the lawyer. He's like, listen here, you polyester puppet. He can't be the judge. It's illegal. Normat has had it out for Huck. He's never liked him. Not a problem. <laughs> God. For whatever reason, the same ghastly looking woman is with him in the same outfit from the bar. Who is she? Because the, the whole time I was like, okay, what, what is she doing exactly? I don't know. But what I do know is the next shot is Huck drinking bleach that he just like grabs off the janitor's thing in the jail cell. He just grabs it through the bars and chugs it and it puts him in the hospital so he can get out of jail. And he just magically never goes back to jail after this. So for some reason. And then like this nun shows up and she's just like, hello, Mr. Finney, blah, blah, blah. And he's just like, well, can you ask the Lord about helping me with rent, child support and alimony? And she's just like, what the fuck? So she like leaves now in the other two cuts or one of the cuts road to revenge. I believe she leaves and that's it. Yes. And the get even cut. Cindy and Rick come to visit. And this one, they come to visit. Hey, I heard you did that bleach thing. Like he's congratulating this man. Yeah. He's just like, oh, I heard you did that bleach trick. I taught you back in 78. <laughs> you know, not only that, fuck? like that tone switch, but also the way that they actually transitioned these two scenes in the champagne and bullets version where it was like, ju- he's drinking bleach and then the, the, it, almost like a, like a South Parky sort of like almost like a family guy, how they'll jump from one scene to the next. That's how it was. I started laughing at a man drinking bleach and then 
waking up in the hospital the next second because there is no transition. No, there's nothing. It's just cut. Bam, he's here. Whereas in the other two versions, they at least showed the outside of the building of the hospital. Right. Like, dare I say, between the two alternate cuts, they both had different ways of doing things, different editors, different... The get even cut was so much better, though. It was. But the other version also had some moments where I was like, all right, I like that better than what get even did. Right. They, like, like what, what could have happened was they took both of those versions, took the best parts and made the champagne of bullets cut. Instead, they just took literally every piece of footage that was filmed and put it in the movie. Yes. Including this bullshit where they're just like, well, you got nothing to worry about. Just hang in there. We're going to get things from Cindy's dads and we'll be back. <laughs> so they go to her dad's. And he just sees, he sees Rick and he's just like, get behind me, Satan. Like he, he immediately assumes that this is a cult like member. And the dad is just like, oh, well, he keeps like, well, he's on drugs or he's, he's hailing Satan. And like, there's drugs and Satan the whole fucking time. And then she bitches her dad out about how she never was given a chance by her parents. And he's just like, you know, one of these days you're going to wind up on the side of the road dead. Plot development. Mm. So they leave. And then an unnecessarily long shot of them talking while she's on the hood of this Jeep and he's talking to her in a silhouette at sunset. And I swear to God, we fast forwarded through this and even fast forwarding through it was still like three minutes. Yeah, it was, it was just way too much. Well, cause there was a song playing. There was literally no dialogue that would have done any justice. He saw the sunset and was like, that's beautiful. We got to film it. Leave it. Yeah. <laughs> Put it in. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Huck is drunk and he shows up to Rick's who has like, or I'm sorry, Rick shows up to Huck's house who's in a swimming pool and these two random chicks are on floating devices and he just leans down and he's just like, you know, this is really funny. The way I equate it is funny. Like the, the dude's life is fucking falling apart, but he just shows up. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm getting married. And you're the best man. It's this Sunday. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like yeah. literally like Sunday. Like the next scene is Sunday. Cut to the marriage scene. She is in a full dress and he is in a white tracksuit pants slash button up shirt outfit combination. And it's the most God awful fucking thing I have ever <laughs> seen in my life. And then they cut to the, the honeymoon sex scene. The fucking music. God, Jesus. Why? Uh, Just no. The mu Oh, fuck. Okay. The music sucks. The sex scene lasted forever. In the other two cuts, they cut it when she's dancing, and then they cut it when she's about to get on the bed with him. I would have done the bed one. Exactly. And this one just lasted forever. It's too much. And that's the thing, too, is he must think that his audience is stupid because he feels the need to show everything. Right. Like, he's got to hold their hand through, like, literally everything. Yeah. You can cut it right here. And everything is implied. We know what's happening. I just, I just don't understand. They could have left, or he could have left so much out. I mean, and obviously he did with other two of these other cuts, but shit, I think some of the most important stuff that did get cut out got cut out, and some of the pointless bullshit was just left, and then, ah. Uh. He edited this thing the way somebody who is making a children's film would edit. <laughs> That's fucking sad, too, man. Like, it's like, oh, I'm going to make this a, not a problem. Make this a kid's film. Yeah. Because think about it, how a child's movie, they have to explain every little thing. That's how this felt. There was nothing left to the imagination, nothing to ponder about, nothing to analyze. Yeah, dude. And this, oh God, look, the next scene I'm about to get into is, look, trigger warning. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. We're actually not even going to get into it deeply because it's, that's fucking terrible. But there, there are some sexual assault things that are about to be discussed briefly. So maybe just skip ahead if you don't want to hear it. So Normad and his crew are talking about Cindy hanging with some cowboy. So he says to eliminate her. Well, at the bar, they show up where the bartender is. And, you know, they basically know that she knows where Cindy is. So they just yeet her ass over the bar, which they cut which I have to laugh at the cut that they did in Road to Revenge because have you ever seen the Perfectly Cut Screams channel? Yes. They yank her over the bar and you just hear, ah! And, that's, and it cuts and you're just like, okay, that's perfect. But it's almost in a comedic fashion that they yeah. cut it where you're just like, yoink! In the get even cut, they yoink her over the bar and they stand her up and they start to rip her clothes and then the scene fades to the next sequence. 
Perfect. However, in Champagne and Bullets, they felt the need to leave the rape scene in, and it was very uncomfortable, very unnecessary. Yeah. You could have literally done it the other two ways, because it is implied that either way, she got her ass handed to her. Right. And they figured out where Cindy was. I would have done it the Road to Revenge version, because in the Get Even cut, it, like you said, it was, it was still a little sleazy, but it was, it was comedic. It didn't fit the tone of the scene. Right. So with that added little context, it's like, okay, there you go. But again, he felt the need to show way too much for way too long. Yep. So Cindy shows Rick the high priest and she's like, oh, this is the high priest. And he's like, well, it's Normad. I've got to stop him. So they leave on their motorcycle and they're chased by two of the crew members and they crash. And Cindy is seemingly dead on the side of the road. And now I say she is seemingly dead because in the get even cut and in the champagne and bullets cut, this is a plot twist. She's dead in the other one. She's dead in road to revenge. Yes. So the best actor award goes to John D Hart for this fucking scene. Cause like he, he's crying quote crying. And then it cuts right to the funeral scene. <laughs> and as the priest is fucking reading the last rites, her dad goes, I told her something like this was going to happen. <laughs> so Again, you he didn't, that out. he didn't care <laughs> he fucking didn't care he didn't care and again from a filmmaker's perspective it's just like the scene in I believe it was the second Smurfs don't even ask me why I've seen this movie and why I remember this part in particular I have a niece okay fuck off there was a scene where girl Smurf Smurfette Smurfette thank you where she is like brought back from being evil or whatever the fuck. And she was like, you came back for me. Papa Smurf was like, of course we did. We're family. That's what family does. And you, you, you could have left it at, of course, you know, because you know, whatever here, it's like, you didn't have to say, I told her this was going to happen because, okay, nobody is going to unironically rewatch this movie, but if they did, at least they can pick up on it whenever he says it the first time to her. Oh shit. That was foreshadowing the whole time. Now it's just this cringy, stupid, why? But I love how the get even title is like just shoved. And by the way, everybody, like, like if you haven't even seen either cut or any of these cuts or seen the title, the, the word get even is literally all caps, one word. Yeah. So he's leaning down and he's just like, I'll get even for you, Cindy. I promise I'll get even. <laughs> cut to Rick punching a punching bag in his garage, wildly fucking punching at this thing. And then a hug just shows up with this native American, like dummy doll and sets it down. And he goes, this saved my life. Thought it might save yours. And he just leaves. And then he comes back and he says something stupid. I don't even remember. What yeah. About like, you know, you're going to need help and all this other bullshit. Well, then there's an immediate just cut to fucking Rick bow or Rambo. Yeah. Fucking third rate Rambo with his dude, this bow and arrow he's got. Have you ever seen a child fire one of those bow and arrows that has the suction cup on the end of it where they just, it's a piss poor job and you have to pretend that they did such a great job. I was that kid. Leave me alone. Well, Devin, you did such a great job. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> no, he fires this goddamn arrow barely and it hits this bastard on the roof and he falls off and then it cuts to a hallway. This is the worst edit in the entire film. And that's saying something yeah. mm -hmm. cuts to this hallway. Now picture just a hallway in your mind. It doesn't matter what hallway it is, but just picture it in your mind. There is a man, a big man standing there. And then it cuts to Rick in the same hallway with a bow and arrow. And I want to say this bow and arrow is actually a fucking like crossbow. You might be onto something. I don't remember. Yeah. It's th that's how bad the edits are. So he just goes, Hey, they're good looking <laughs> and he pulls and fires the arrow, but you don't see the arrow fly. It goes from him releasing the string, same hall background, same location, same exact spot. And the dude just appears out of thin air and he's, Oh, and he turns around with the arrow on his back and he falls the fuck over. And the entire time they're at Normad's base. Cause that's where they're at. Normad is trying to make a drug deal. And he fucking shoots the drug dealer and the chick that he brought with him because he thought they brought the feds. <laughs> no, it's just shimmy sliding Rick's dumb fuckery. 
rolling up in this bitch. Not a problem. <laughs> Fucking shootout happens. And he rolls in there because Norman has this satanic ritual he is trying to perform at the last fucking minute for some god awful reason. Surprised to see me? Like he, Rick rolls in. Surprised to see me? He you Rick got rolled. He did. He Rick rolled up in that motherfucker, dude. And he's just like, you got enough drugs to get you put away for thirty years. Except two guys come in and they take him outside. And Norman is just like, huh, uh, like you know, he just goes back to his shit. Well, they get shot. Yeah. Because Huck shows up and gets shot again. This man could have, like we said earlier, could have been cut way the fuck out. He really didn't do anything. Again, okay, whenever he brought in the uh, Native American doll, that was a scene where I was like, hold on, hold on, they might be doing with something with this character. No. And then he comes back in and he reassesses the entire point of that scene. And I was like, god damn it. And then again here, I was like, Okay, whoa, whoa, wait, he might be doing something here. He's trying to redeem all of his fuck-ups. He made Rick's life a living hell for a little while. Now he saves it. Okay, I wouldn't have done it that way, but okay, cool. He doesn't. He just gets shot. Yeah. And so, again, I'm like, cut the man out. Exactly. So Normad goes right back to his little ritual. <laughs> and then Rick just walks right back into frame. The same shot, same way he's holding the gun, like not even ruffled up from earlier. And he's just like, it's me again. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. Just the way he just says, it's me again. Just <laughs> no gusto whatsoever. Just calm. Yeah. Just like, he's almost like Terry Funk. I was going to say Orange Cassidy, but okay. And he's Terry Funk. He's, well, Norman, it's me again. Like he's fucking bored. You're the kind of puke that makes the world decay. I don't sell my soul to the devil. You <laughs> killed the only woman I ever loved. <laughs> and then they quote, fight, which is more like bitch slapping. Yeah. And he stabs Normad. And then Normad, as he's dying, is like, I'll see you in hell, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> like. <laughs> Swear to God, dude, he says not a problem right after that. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so they fucking leave. Like, Rick and Huck are, like, hunched over carrying each other to their beat-the-fuck-up Pinto car, whatever the fuck they're driving. And then Rick is back at the grave in his god-awful track suit. Now, here's where the big difference is between these movies. Yeah. In the Road to Revenge cut, he's, he's fixing the flowers up, and the nun shows up, and as she walks up, they fade to black and the credits roll. Now in both the get even and champagne and bullets cut, the nun is just like, well, you really helped out Huck. Hey, so rather than a long explanation, could you give me a ride to the hospital? And Rick's like, well, I really want to visit with Cindy and spend some time, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I really need you to bring me to the hospital. And he's like, well, okay, I guess I could. Well, Cindy's alive. They faked her death because they had all these people out for her, which is stupid because the nun could have like, they're all dead. So none could have told him, Hey, she's alive. Yeah. So Rick is so monotone when he says this, he's like, well, you don't have to worry no more. They're idle. <laughs> they're idle. That's, That's a, a funny, funny way, way of, of saying, saying dead. It. Yeah, exactly. That's a funny way of saying dead, but just the delivery is like, Oh, I'm so happy to see you. You got no worries. Nobody's going to follow you anymore. They're idle. Which, Basically means, yeah, I slaughtered them all. Cold blood. And then, wouldn't you know, in this version, the shimmy side instrumental plays to close us out. The end. <sighs> Again, like I said earlier, uh, somewhere within all of these edits, I don't want to say there's a good movie, but you take bits and pieces of all three of them, particularly the two edits. And you've got s something coherent or cut all of the filler out and distribute this thing for what you intended it to be clearly, which is a porno. Somewhere there's a fourth version, I'm sure. And that's Champagne and Bullets. Autumn is in the air. The pumpkins are in the patch. And our friends at Manscaped are here to make sure you don't carve your pant pumpkins when you're grooming, if you know what I'm saying. Make sure you're keeping things fresh this fall with the leaders in male grooming and their brand new fourth generation performance package. Boys, get ready for a cuffing season like no other. Take the leap into fall with Manscaped, 
by joining the 2 million men worldwide that use Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the code SUPER. It's time to bundle up with the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver ball deodorant, crop reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. First off, the new Performance Package 4.0 includes the new Lawnmower 4.0. If you're looking to cozy up this fall, this trimmer is essential. This fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It also gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. Plus, it's waterproof. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker to chop up your worst weeds up top in your nose and ear. This nose and ear hair trimmer uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual-blade system to provide proprietary skin-safe technology which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate places. Seal the deal with Manscaped liquid formulations. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. Season your balls up, because everybody knows pumpkin spice lattes and ball deodorant go hand in hand. Then, after trimming the pumpkin patch and whacking the leaves, give your balls a boost and use the Crop Reviver. Manscaped is even throwing in two free gifts to this Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxer Briefs and the Shed Travel Bag. Get comfy at home and on the go this season. Get 20% off plus free shipping by using our code SUPER at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping using our code SUPER at manscaped.com. Make your balls a priority this fall. Your balls will thank you. Let's get into Joel D. Weinkoop's Lost Faith. Now, this deserves its own little backstory as well. Unlike John D. Hart, who had the only sole film credit for Champagne and Bullets, this movie and a lot of, if not all of Joel D. Weinkoop's films are most infamously shot on video. Not film, not digitally. Video. Oh, oh, like camcorder that's why the quality was like it was i see now lost faith is one of over 150 films that this man has done that's like the james patterson of making films yes i bought this dvd directly from joel himself right on yeah exactly if that tells you like how dedicated to this fucking podcast I am as far as getting these movies to fucking watch and review. I found him and I went to his eBay store and bought this movie directly from this man. Mostly because you can't find the son of a bitch anywhere. But I also wanted a copy of this because it's one of his movies that has actually been redistributed by cult movie mania. It's a, it's a company that is like redistributing other, you know, films and stuff. So this movie opens on Steve Nakoda, who is the main character played by Joel D. Weinkoop himself. Again, he write, edit, directing, star. That's the, that is the link between the two of these movies. These yeah. are both vanity projects, for lack of a better term. Well, I've got another comparison, too. One is about Satanism. One is about finding faith. My stupid ass forgot to say that, too. I'm glad you fucking remember. Yeah, they really are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. So Steve wakes up from a dream sequence. And this music fucks, by the way. It really does. The music in this movie kicks so much ass. Like, it doesn't always fit the tone of the scenes. But if you just are listening to the soundtrack, I don't know if the soundtrack exists, but if you listen to it, it's like, fuck yeah, this is pretty cool. If you want, like, 1992, this is it. Like, both of these movies came out, like, a year apart. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's actually crazy to think about. Yeah, dude. So he wakes up from this dream sequence, right? He goes to this fucking modeling agency and the police are there and he finds out that his wife was kidnapped here. <laughs> and it's not just a kidnapping. It is, quote, a simple kidnapping. You well, remember that shit? The yeah, fucking was, oh, it's just a simple kidnapping. Well, it's a simple kidnapping. It's a simple kidnapping. How, it's, a, it's a simple kidnapping. Well, how simple is it? It's very simple. Yeah, like... As opposed to a complex one? Like, a kidnapping is a kidnapping, dude. I mean, it wasn't a complex. God damn it. It was a shopping complex. God damn it. <laughs> Go clock out. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, fuck. All right, Who's going to edit this uh, shit? I'm back. It's cool. Okay, cool. 
Let's talk about the fucking police sketch. Oh, you mean a uh, fucking... Oh, God, what was her name in Napoleon Dynamite? Was it Trisha? Yes. Yeah, the Trisha drawing from Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> I love it because he, like, he looks like Sasquatch. And it, out to the side, it says, bad guy, dash, he laughed a lot. Yeah, I'm like, what? Who did this? Yeah, and then it cuts from there to a chase scene in the woods where this chick is, like, reapprehended by some guy in the fucking woods and brought back to something. <laughs> And it's a fucking woman slave camp, dude. At this point, I was like, hold on, hold on. This one is actually getting to the point. Thank you. Right. So the main guy that is running this shit is such a ham on the fucking camera, like the bad guy or whatever. And yeah. he's just like, arrange the women. I wish to speak to them now. <laughs> At least two of you are expendable. I could use an attractive young lady for one of my own purposes. And you're just like, what the fuck, bro? At least they're getting to the fucking point. Yeah. And then it cuts to this guy playing this guitar on the side of the fucking sidewalk. And you were just like, is this a live action South Park? That's what it felt like. Because the guy playing the guitar definitely felt like fucking uh, Cartman. Like, I can hear Cartman doing that. He even kind of mildly sounded like him. And then there was a scene later on of, dare I say, like five minutes, Mm. maybe. Maybe. There was a big fat dude in like a fucking luchador mask and a cape and a hallway screaming and yelling i was like that's fucking butters the whole movie felt like it was a live action parody that's that's pretty funny though it is so steve walks up to the guy playing the guitar and he's none chucking his keys because you know he's got a he's got to show he's a badass yeah and he just looks up get a job <laughs> and at that point whenever he said get a job i was like find your wife <laughs> steve bumps into this guy and he's just like oh i'm sorry the guy's like, well, what's your problem? You're not sorry. You're pathetic. <laughs> it's like, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. So Steve mouths off the detective about not finding his wife and all these other kidnapped women. He's just like, you'll stay out of this investigation. And Steve's just like, I'll handle it myself. And then he runs into this man named Walt who reminds Steve, you haven't been to church in quite some time. Now, I know you've had a lot of problems, and Steve's like, well, I've had more problems this week than the average guy's had in a year. And to top it off, my wife's missing. Like, like it's, it's some sitcom. Like, the way he yeah. said it was so sitcom, it was so funny. And that, again, it's a pair. I don't, I don't understand. It's a parody, but it's not. And you called the detective with a pinky ring. Uh-huh. At the minute he answered that phone and I saw a pinky ring, I was like, you cannot trust this motherfucker. And then it cuts back to Walt. Now, have you prayed about it, Steve? Hell no. You find out Steve has lost his faith. Ah, oh, <laughs> movie title. Yay. Roll credits. Steve is driving down the street and another car chases him down. And this is the fight you mentioned earlier where it runs him off the road. And Steve just decides to beat the shit out of them. And this is the first time you see him fight. Yeah. And both of our reactions was, oh, my God. To this. I, I've seen the movie. I still don't know how he is the way he is. They Does he never, just know Kung Fu? That's what I'm saying. There was nothing mentioned. There was no montage of him in any Taekwondo classes. There was no mention of, oh, in my early years, I did blah, blah, blah. Nothing. He's just a natural born killer. And it's the weirdest thing. In this same sequence, it's this chick that gets out and she's harassing him with these other dudes and she keeps calling him by a completely different name. Like she's mistaken him for somebody. And so he just looks at her and he just fucking gives her sweet chin music right to the goddamn fucking right in the face, dude. And she just she fucking ashes. <laughs> she just fucking hits the crap. She goes limp like Peter on Family Guy. Oh my god, like after the uh after all the chicken nuggets and he just Yeah. Pfft, yeah. So he beats their asses while this other gang member is across the street calling somebody on a payphone about it. Meanwhile, I know that this man asked everybody in the vicinity if they wanted to be in this movie because there is a shot where this truck driver goes to get out of the truck and the woman is turned to him and just starts cussing him and screaming and growling at him. And he just like puts his foot back in the truck and drives off. Cause you know, Joel was like, you want to be in this movie? You ain't got to do shit. Just park your truck and wait for my cue. And this yeah. is what you do. That man probably has never seen this. Oh God. No, he probably forgot about it. <laughs> two, two bastards are just going to be talking about him on some podcast. 
And, he, and he'll never hear this either. No. So why is the scene taking forever though? Like he's kicking the shit out of them, but the scene is just going and going and going and going. The woman just constantly talking with her fucking meth mouth. Methany. <laughs> <laughs> so like Steve drives home. He's like, what else could go wrong? Apparently a lot because a dude is ripping his house off and he runs into him when he rounds the corner. And this man drives after him because the dude runs to his car and and Steve is like, fuck that. And he chases him. And then it cuts to the main bad guy at the fucking woman camp. And he's admonishing one of the guys about having guns. He's like, I trained you in the arts. And if you need guns to guard a bunch of women, you're a pussy or some shit. (laughs) Which at that point, I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like this movie could never be made today. It ne- it wouldn't have been anyway. But no. Dude, even back then that okay. Uh wow. Steve shows up to this used car lot where this woman is in talks to buy this yellow Ford Mustang. So he rolls up, gets out of his car cuz it's never explained until later that he runs out of gas. Yeah, it Initially, I had no idea what was happening. Yeah, so he runs across the street to get this car to chase the guy that is still getting away. And the conversation where she's about to buy this car, he barrel rolls over the hood and gets in the car and just drives off. Barrel rolled. He fell. Yeah, I tried to make him sound cool. No, don't. No, this is a review. We are reviewing it for what it is. Okay, he fell the fuck over this hood, okay? So he falls the fuck over this goddamn hood and lazily gets in this car and drives it off. The lady in question is just like, can I drive it when he gets back? The car is almost like, he stole it, you stupid moron. And she's like, you mean without paying? Yeah, you stupid bitch. And she slaps him for it. Well, he loses the guy. Meanwhile, like the women are trying to plot their entire escape as this sequence is happening. So... One of the chicks like kind of seduces one of the guards a little bit and plays along with him being creepy and she crushes his fucking head with a huge rock. Yeah. Fucking deserved it though. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then Steve rolls up to some dude and they fight in the woods and this is obviously at some park somewhere because dude, during this shot, there are kids playing in the background. There are fucking kids in the background of this fucking movie, dude. Just there. This whole scene. Have you ever seen on like an Instagram page or a Facebook page where there's just a a weird no context scene of a film and the caption is like what the fuck or something something right. stupid yeah that's what this is i want somebody to just post this one scene and see how many people in the comments is like what movie is this and i want to see how many actually know like who who's going to nail this yeah well steve winds up kicking this guy's ass and this guy, mind you, is very rotund, fugly. I'm not trying to be an asshole, but I'm calling it like I see it. And this fine ass chick shows up and starts berating Steve for beating her boyfriend up. Whoa, boyfriend. What the fuck? Me and you both like jumped out of the goddamn sofa. Yeah. I was like, flag on the play. Come again. <laughs> and again. Yeah, he did. He did. Unfortunately, he did. You know she didn't. No, God, no. But here's the thing, too. It's like a weird relationship. Just within this one scene, I was like, this is getting uncomfortable. Because she was, like, going off and off and off about, like, my little baby. my, my Just cuddling him like fucking Norman Bates type of weird vibe. <clears throat> it was fucking awkward, man. And he's just like, well, this looks like the guy that robbed my house and all this other shit. And then... No, it didn't. No, it really didn't. It really fucking didn't. So they all leave and then the cops just show up and they arrest Steve. And this chick from the camp that is still running away from earlier gets to this boat and takes it. And then the main bad guy, because I don't know his name, but the main bad guy is beating this punching bag up. And this is the one where you were talking about where he's swinging at it really wildly. and just like It looks like he's doing like fucking like trying to like Wonder Twins punch this fucking punching bag. It was fucking weird. And. It didn't help the character because he's supposed to be this trained badass. He looks like a dumb fuck. He looks like a fired PE teacher, dude. He really does. 
Dude, it was just so bad. Like his costume even says like fuck it. Like it doesn't literally, but I guarantee you, like at one point this man goes home and his pajamas are the fucking navy blue gym t shirt and oh, shorts combo. With the, with the white, white strip with the yep. name <laughs> written in Sharpie on the little white line. And it just says bad guy on it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. But anyway, yeah, dude, he's like, he's Barnes. That's his second in command. He's explaining to Barnes that they're using these women for porno. They're going to make porno with these women. And then he mentions his police force partner, which go figure. It's Mr. Pinky Ring. Mm hmm. So Walt bails Steve out of prison or jail. And they walk back into Steve's garage. And Steve is just like, man, my life has been shit. He starts going on about how he's lost his faith because of all like the crime and misjustice. And then Walt is just like, you need to ask for Jesus's help. And Steve refuses. He's just like, things can only get any worse. Well, how could they only get worse? They can only go up from here. And it's just this whole like development where it's going to come into play later. And I, you called, I think we both kind of called this during the final sequence, but Steve just kind of gives him the, the nice version of get the fuck out of my house. Yeah. While he's bench pressing like 50 pounds. The way he throws that across the room. Though. You dude, you were shaming the fuck out those those dumbbells and the dude, fucking weight bench it, and everything. Because it pissed me off. I weigh 125 and I bench 180. There is no goddamn reason as to why this man, who is probably, I don't know, 210, is benching 50. I understand like... Because the next shot is him throwing it. Right, right. I get that part, but they have fake weights for movie sets. You didn't have to do it like that. It looked bad. Barnes tells the main boss about the girl that escaped, and he's like, when did she escape? And he's like, he tries to hide it. He's just like, about four or five hours ago. <laughs> She's like, he fucked up bad. He fucked up up <laughs> so the boss he's like he almost goes full on vince mcmahon god damn it no, <laughs> he, no. <laughs> he fucking calls the police department and it, and it almost kind of reminds me of the 89 batman get me lieutenant a call <laughs> <laughs> you know that he's, get me lieutenant a god <laughs> god damn it <laughs> so he fucking calls and this girl shows up to Steve's, the one that took the boat, and she starts telling him about the modeling agency and how it's a scam, and this is how they're getting women. Like, they're taking the women like this. So Steve has her put on camouflage. They can't see you in this. <laughs> so nonchalant. He's just like, they can't see you in this camo. Meanwhile, he's wearing a, what do you call it? He's got fatigue. Yeah. Like, he's wearing full-blown, like, camo and fatigue and all this other shit. And <laughs> when she, she looks like she's leaving to go put something, like, put her hair up, and then he just throws these like shadow kicks and punches in the living room. And he's just like, -ah! -ah! -ha! <laughs> swear. And then the detective shows up to his house, you know, the one that's involved. Yeah. And Steve fights him. And the whole time I forgot to mention this same detective gives Steve this, this kind of same bullshit line where he's just like, I'm a police officer and I demand respect. And he kicks the shit out of him. And the chick is just like, Let's go. What if he gets up and he's just like, gets up. He ain't getting up after a kick like that. <laughs> so they roll up on the boat and the boss tells Barnes to get the girls ready. And then Steve fights like these randos in the fucking woods. Meanwhile, we forgot to mention there's like two guards. There's like this really like tiny dude with a board and this milady fedora Dennis Nedry from <laughs> Jurassic Park looking motherfucker. It, you cracked me up because you you said it looked like fucking Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah. Build her a cake or something. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, dude. <laughs> so he's the fucking the dude has been looking in these binoculars at all kinds of shit. He's like, well, how long are we going to be here? My show's on. I can't miss my show. It's Thursday. And I know the feeling, dude. I can't miss AEW Dynamite on Wednesdays. Amen. So I, I get it. I feel your pain, buddy. He fucking like rolls up he, he, he's only concerned about getting his break or getting relieved so pedro runs away and gets his ass beat and then steve walks up and he's like fuck he's huge i don't know if i could take him and then he just looks at steve and he's like oh thank god are you my relief and steve's like uh, yeah actually yeah i am and um 
He's like, yeah, just just stay right here and uh, and keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job or whatever. And he just fucking walks right past. Him. Funny sequence, because let's be honest, that dude didn't deserve to get his ass kicked. He's just there. Right. My boy wants to go home and veg out. Yeah. Just relax. Fuck it. <laughs> and we finally get to the scene where he's whooping all these people's asses just left and right, like throwing kicks, haymakers, roundhouses, you name it. He's doing it. And he's beating the shit out of everybody. Well, the boss is practicing all his moves. And he's bitching at Barnes. He's like, you're my second in command and you fucked up big time and all this other shit. Steve rolls up on this Lord Raiden looking motherfucker. I'm not kidding. He's got the hat and everything. But except when he disrobes and gets into his fighting gear, he looks like Bruce Lee. Can we talk about the waving wildly bullshit that he's doing with his goddamn arms? Yeah, he he was in good shape. He tried. He was not trained. But he beats the crap out of him with ease. Then Steve rolls up and this dude's got a knife. And he beats his ass. And after the fact, he's like, what is this, a tournament? <laughs> Apparently so. You ran into Raiden. It, it's a tournament, buddy. Yeah. And then the guard radios the boss. He's like, this might be one of the best lines in this whole fucking movie. Boss, the guy's here. He's coming for you. He knows karate. Yeah. <laughs> As if he's coming for you wasn't enough. Right. It's just like, he's coming for you. Oh, wait, wait. He knows karate too. And he just <laughs> fucking like runs away. Well, Steve is like punched in the face and he's demanded to fight Barnes by the boss. Now, Steve makes pretty easy work of this bastard. And then Steve starts fighting the boss and he's getting his ass kicked. Steve is getting his ass whooped in front of the girls, in front of all the guards, in front of everybody. And he asks finally for God's help which I called this happening. I was like, he's going to get his ass kicked until he asks for help from Jesus. And then he's going to fucking kick some ass. And that's exactly what fucking happened. Cause he gives the, the whole flashback of the whole movie where he's just like, I'm sorry. You're not sorry. You're pathetic. And all this, this other whole shit. sequence was just weird. We, you said it earlier. We should have been high. Yeah. Because there was no previous edit that was even remotely like this. So it's not even like it. It was within the realm of what was normal within the movie. Mm hmm. No, it was just some random balls tripping, just tie-dye. Just, I don't even know how to describe it. Yeah, right. It's just so ridiculous. And then, like, after he beats his ass, the girls all kick the guards' asses. And then Steve beats the shit out of Barnes again. And he's like, tie these guys up. I'll be back. And he goes and finally reconnects with his wife. And then some woman named Connie was, like, they said that their, her body was found behind the house and... And he's like, let's go. Like, they're on a beach somewhere somehow. It's like, I guess it's an island or it's some kind of whatever the fuck. But he's just like, let's go. There's a chopper waiting for us. Where? Fucking how? <laughs> how did he get a hold of a chopper? Who did he call that has a fucking chopper? He's been doing all this shit by himself. If he knew somebody with a chopper, chances are he knew people with firepower and could have kicked the shit out of everybody that way. Where was this from the beginning? I don't know, but that was the end. And, and that, that is lost faith. Yeah. Because they yeah. literally fade to black. What the fuck? Which one of these wins this week? Initially, I thought there was no possible way. Whatever you could show me would beat out champagne and bullets. This one, I don't know. Because this gave it a run for its money. Just for the simple, the freeway fight scene and the weird edit towards the end. I'll be honest. I feel like Lost Faith gets to win this week because action happened fighting happened funny shit happened character development happened plot happened champagne and bullets was kind of a mind fuck of random shit not to say that it wasn't enjoyable but comparatively speaking with this lost faith absolutely kicked the shit out of it this week yes had it gone up against pro I will, i'll say this had this movie gone up against the get even cut only maybe it stood a chance yeah yeah i feel like champagne and bullets is something that is to simply be experienced right get drinks get friends prepare to laugh same with lost faith too. get friends get drinks get weed get whatever the fuck you want and and enjoy the fuck out of it these were fun movies to watch respectively but I really feel like Joel D. Winecoop's Lost Faith is the absolute winner this week. I agree. Yeah. If you want to buy either of these, Vinegar Syndrome still has some copies of 
champagne and bullets for sale. They, I think they only limited it to like 6,000 copies. I have copy 1,112. They numbered them, uh, lost faith. You can find this one on eBay. Like if you actually go and search enough, you'll find Joel Winecoop's eBay shop, buy it from him. He ships it directly himself. And it actually is a DVD with the cover and a professionally printed everything. So check that shit out. Visit supermediabrospodcast.com for all past, present, and future episodes. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Buy some merch. Check out all the other shows on the Odd Pods Media Network. Leave us a rating and review on Podchaser or Apple Podcasts. Like us. Subscribe to us. Tell a friend. Follow us on social media. All of this can be found in the show notes below. Dude, thanks a lot for uh, sitting in with me and uh, coming on this ridiculous adventure of fuckery. Dude, thanks for having me. I'm always down. For oh, that. I know you are, but I told you I was going to make it. Okay. So anybody that hasn't listened to this one episode, we, we actually did one together uh, about, I think maybe 10 or so episodes ago, maybe. Something like that, yeah. And we did alien private eye versus robo chick. And let's be honest, alien private eye was great. And we suffered tremendously through that second film. And I promised you that I was going to make up for it next time we got together to do something. Dude, not only that, but just glad we actually recorded this shit at a decent hour. Oh my God. Yeah. We recorded that one at like two in the fucking morning. And I had just gotten off work, working a double. And I had to go to work the next day. I did too. So I was like, by the time we were done recording, it was damn near four o'clock. And I rolled into work the next day. It yeah. was like, oh, I did too. And I was like, I rolled into the parking lot at like seven. So I probably had about two, two and a half hours of sleep before I worked yet another double. We looked as disheveled as Huck on the sofa. Dude, it was so bad. And that whole recording episode, uh, for all the listeners out there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was not on my game. I was fucking exhausted. And so was I. But those movies were pretty exhausting, too. They were, yeah. Yeah. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, yeah, I'm going to get the fuck out of here. All right, man. So uh, again, thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Devin, thanks again for hanging out. Again, we're going to do this again one day, I'm sure. Hell yeah. All right. So until next week, I've been Midnight Agent Raw. And I am Special Delivery Dev. Shades on. We're off. <laughs>